very delighted to have you back to ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architectures. This is going to be our 178th show, and we're the second show into the new year. And we're broadcasting live uh, once again uh, from three continents of the world, me being on the European uh, side in uh, Germany. And then we have you, Ron, on the mainland continent of the United States, and we have you de Soto back on the uh, Hawaiian archipelago, right? Archipelago. Oh, so, sorry, yeah. Thanks for <laughs> continuing to teach me English. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, glad to be uh, reunited here with us. And uh, this is uh, recapping here what we've been doing uh, in the last show, the first show, which is talking about a lot of things. But if we try to summarize, it was pretty much about democracy and, and, and hopefully and wishfully a renaissance of integrity and authenticity. And uh, things are changing on, on a fast pace on a daily basis in, in all the areas that we're confronted with. Also, we have to do a little update, unfortunately, on the good news that we had to spread last time that the uh, university's approach uh, of the uh, Indian Institute of Management to tear down uh, Lucan's uh, most legendary dorms through uh, a massive outcry of scholars and professionals, us amongst, to prevent that. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, Nathaniel Khan and his sisters who had to pour a little bit of uh, water into that sweet wine and uh, having to say um, the university was putting that on hold but it's not off the table. So, so once again, uh, when we say we the people have the power, there's also some other people out there that we have to continue to convince. And that's on big politics and, 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 and small stages as well, right? So uh, let's please, again, Nathaniel once uh, told me that making the movie amongst many things has also brought the family back together. Now him and his sisters were writing this letter and we're also hoping, uh, Ron, that uh, Eric Bricker, who's going to do a movie uh, about your guys' work, is going to stick to that. Because once again, in these days of being locked down, you're a big fan and a big consumer of, of Netflix. We need these media to spread the good word of, as we call this show, cultivated versus cynical classicism. And uh, if you go to the next slide, um, talking also another media is pretty much books, right? And you just made us aware of this one here. And what are we looking at, Ron? Yeah, uh, I found uh, when I went up to my uh, local uh, design bookstore that uh, Tashin Publishers had provided a fine, small pocket-sized book about the case study houses. And I've got to uh, take just a moment to uh, give a shout out to Tashin. They make the really the most beautiful and sometimes the largest books you can imagine on all of the arts. Some of them are so large that weak people can't even lift them uh, and hold them in their lap. But, but Tashkin isn't elitist because at the same time, they will put out small, very uh, inexpensive books for art lovers and students. And this is an example because this little six inch by eight inch book uh, is the small version of, of, a, of the case study house book, whereas the large version costs four times as much and is one foot wide by one foot four inches long. And even though this is a, a pocket book, a book of sorts, it has a massive 576 pages inside. So I, I could not help but buy two extra copies uh, for my co-hosts and thanks for the opportunity to be working with them again. And we will see that in a minute. And thanking you, Ron. Uh, as of now, we're seeing another book that we see uh, four pieces of POMO um, um, uh, fossil and formalist um, buildings, right? Yeah, we're talking about uh, sort of inauthentic classes or inauthentic use of, of styles that that aren't modern and. What we're, what we're seeing is uh, some buildings by Philip Johnson, all done in 1984, 1985, high rises, 700, 800 feet tall, that are definitely not modern because he had fallen 
for what is a, a, a strange postmodernist fad. And at the lower right, you can see the, the most famous of these Homo office buildings, which were just glazed hermetic boxes again with no response to nature. Uh, the most famous one is that AT&T building, which turned a high rise building into an enormous Chippendale cabinet with a Chippendale top. And then at the lower left, you see Pittsburgh Plate Glasses headquarters. And this is really something. Here's another high rise, but at the top, there are little finials and towers placed. So it looks something like the Houses of Parliament in London. That was built in Pittsburgh in 1984. At the uh, upper left is what was called the NCNB Center. And here you see, in my mind, the wildest example. Here are three step gables that resemble guild halls and town halls of late medieval Holland and Germany, which you probably recognize yourself, uh, Martin. That was built in Houston, Texas. And then finally, at the upper right, you see what was called the Transco Tower in Houston, uh, again in Houston. This time it's a 1930s art modern design. Later, we're gonna talk about Trump's desire to have all federal architecture be in a, and this is what a high, rise, high rises might look like if that ever came true. Absolutely. And so we're, you know, we've been talking, this has been going on for a while. And as we're referencing at the very top right, once movie star Ronnie took over, we're talking 80s and we're talking about surface versus substance before. And it's dragging along until, as we pointed out in the last show, until architects of these days who are getting up in age, but not getting off the stage, which they should, as Wolf Briggs, who is doing the same kind of uh, different style, but the same attitude, just fossil formalism. And we can say this is probably not, uh, this wasn't basically federally mandated classicism, but it was, it was capitalistically fostered uh, classicism, again, uh, as a symbol of, of power and a, and a symbol of, of chauvinism, we can say, right? It was chauvinist capitalism. But let's turn on to better things. Go to the next slide, uh, please. And we see pretty much here what you were talking about, Ron. And we can also see here uh, that nice little, uh, we're the second show into the new year. So happy holidays to have had. And here's the Santa Claus competition that you guys have going on. At that point, your beard, Ron, was only half the one that we are happy to see now. And again, your Santa Claus gift to us was that wonderful book that again, representative for you, uh, DeSoto also. This is our copy that we got from you. And let's go to the next slide and see what's in the book. And here's one example. And what are we looking at, Ron, that is very familiar to you? Well, as a nice surprise to me, I'm seeing a drawing I've never seen before, but that I do know that it was Ed Killingsworth's original drawing at the lower right. But what we're looking at is the triad case study houses, two pages of, of uh, the coverage in that book about it. And here's an example where a very modern architecture who provided these beautiful modern glass pavilions of exposed structure infilled with invisible glazing use classicism to really create an importance to a gathering of buildings. In other words, he used sim uh, symmet symmetry and he had central axes, both in the site plans and the symmetry in the houses themselves. And this was a, an attempt to create some community mindedness through architecture and planning among the disparate people who would buy and live in those homes. Yeah, and coming full circle to the beginning, um of Lucan, what is the piece of architecture that we mostly associate with this place in La Jolla uh, near San Diego that was actually built, and this is sort of surprising us because this was built at the late 50s in the early, in the early 60s and in the mid 60s, next slide, what do we all associate with uh, that place? You guys help us out. Well, I've never been there, but Ron knows what it is. I have to confess that when I saw it for the first time, 
I happen to have been sent down from my military base to La Jolla to take a course in military justice. So I'd know something about how to handle uh, court cases in the military. And so I took the time to visit the Salk Institute when it was barely open. So it was fresh and crisp and new. I walked into a courtyard, a central courtyard, completely empty, no, no vegetation, just an incredibly spare architecture, a completely uh, featureless courtyard with a single slim runnel of water running to the ocean. And off in the distance, the sky and the sound of the surf pounding in at La Jolla below. And for the first time in my life, I, I suddenly found myself with tears in my eyes. Uh, the, the architecture was incredibly spare and beautiful. There were only three materials that, that could be seen, but it was all light and space. The architecture was almost secondary, light and space. But when I looked at the architecture, it was only concrete framing within which were placed some wooden panels, some large wood panels, but the panels themselves contained very small residential windows so that these studies where the scientists went to sort of regroup and think uh, could look out into the courtyard or off to the ocean and invent polio vaccine. And I just might point out too, that that is very relevant for us living through the plague of COVID-19 right, right now, because during the 1950s, there was a crash program to develop vaccinations against uh, polio, which Dr. Salk was one of the creators of. And we just are going through the, the crash creation of the COVID-19 vaccine as well. So again, we're, we're trying to provide from uh, our own eyewitnessing. And uh, this picture is from a trip during my, my desert days. Uh, this is sort of a Bonnie and Clyde trip with his lovely young emerging talent here. We were both at the first time in this moment seeing um, uh, this, this masterpiece here. We started out the trip out in Palm Springs, uh, which we see at the very top. Uh, this is a house by another case study house uh, participant, uh, Craig Elwood who actually that wasn't his real name. His name was Johnny Berkey. And also uh, different than you guys, um, um, Ron, who, who Ed has always been crediting you guys to a point in having make you partners later on. Uh, Craig Elwood uh, slash John Berkey didn't really do that. So we wanna pay tribute uh, to this gentleman who we uh, quote up there, Alvaro, who was uh, supposedly the chief designer on this project which was for uh, Max Pulaski, who we later knew through the company Intel. This is a late addition to our courtyard series, by the way. They called it like a house between two walls and a courtyard spanning in between. But it's also a prime example of axial symmetric uh, symmetry. So we can call this classicist as we see with the floor plan, basically of, of the SOC Institute here as well, right? So why don't we move on to the next slide? And basically here, just reiterating, Ron, what you had said when you had your first teardrops about architecture, when you saw the sock, as I shared with you, that I was uh, uh, in, in tears when I saw the, the My Architect movie. And you still are, as you said, and this is a, a contemporary picture of you in your beautiful uh, cabana courtyard uh, house and in your Mesian lounge chair there. And once again, illustrating what you had shared with us around what time you had seen that when you were looking just as long as young as you still do. Let's go on to the next slide because we wanna share another one of Lucan's works. And this one here is in a different uh, climate. As you can tell, the white stuff in the foreground is what I'm having here in my front yard at this time of the year. This is snow. This is Exeter Library. This is north of Boston. Um, and, and this is uh, again during my prairie days when the University of Nebraska Lincoln was uh, generous enough to send us out to conferences and I had the chance to see that. And speaking about you know, Trump's claim in, in this mandate of classicism for federal buildings, he says, well, People don't like modernism. They like to see Greek temples. So this is playing probably into his hands because people these days would probably not find this particularly appealing, right? It's rather austere. 
It's a chunk of a mephirid of brick. And the door is rather non-descriptive and you have to go through this little mouse hole in there to let yourself be compressed only then to have next slide, the wow effect to be released into this. And you've witnessed that Ron as well and share your feelings and experiences once you were drawn up into this sort of pantheon like and Lu Khan basically had visited all the uh, monuments, the historic monuments in, in Europe and got inspired by them, but didn't mimic them or copy them. It basically took them to another proud, heroic American level, right? What I liked about the library when I visited it was that uh, on approach, it's a sort of brooding, monumental, but classically symmetrical brick mass. Uh, and in walking inside, the classicism of a central atrium, skylit, multi-story, is there, but he was a humanist at heart as well. And so he really rejected that idea of a sort of conventional large reading hall, because he felt that reading was a private act. And so what he did uh, was he put the people uh, in small uh, study areas and study carols, or pieces of furniture, all around the perimeter of the building so that there was light where people were, were reading privately. And, and that's part of the next slide that shows us perfectly, Ron. Surely. And that part of the building was sort of the outer donut of the building, which was all uh, brick construction. But the, the, there's an inner uh, donut as well where the books are. And that had to be concrete because books are massive, they're incredibly heavy, and they need to be kept away from light. So here's the humanist, as you'll see in, some, in the next slide, providing a very residentially scaled, handsome, comfortable place to read quietly and in private, and to take over the place and make it your very own, and not be huddled in the middle of an enormous reading hall. Yeah, and this, this young couple here, when I took this picture, they found it weird that I wanted to capture them when they were dating and I explained why and they bought it. So, uh, and again, we think, as, as you said, Ron, he was a people's guy. He was less about himself, but about the building and the people in there. So he would have loved that. And let's go to the next slide. He would have loved the same as well as we think. And while traditionally you would think he don't, you know, kick a, a Lou Khan building with your feet, we believe he would have loved that because he wanted the people to be comfortable and again, use the perimeter of the building, as you said, Ron, as to read. And he would have loved these booths to have taped these things on and have the empty, you know, beef jerky back there and, and the soda pop, because that's like people really use it the way. And, and next slide is like, um, I was able to take that picture of a drawing that's, that's pinned up at the, at the lobby of the building. And you can see this is, this is less about architecture. This is more about the people and their human event and activity. And the architecture is basically a stage for that. So it's, it's you know, that, that drawing really sort of, um, you know, became a reality in, in, in the build example. And, and the next slide, um, uh, let's return to basically that, uh, that Trumpian uh, uh, classicism mandate and have you, Ron, reflect on that a little further. Yeah, Joe Biden in the first 100 days has so many edicts and uh, presidential proclamations and laws to overturn in that first 100 days. Uh, he's gonna be busy. There's not a single bit about uh, living a life in the United States that isn't affected by these presidential uh, ideas, including architecture, unfortunately. Uh, his executive order, uh, which is in place now, is that federal architecture, and pardon the pun, uh, he put together a sort of trumped up group that calls itself the National Civic Art Society. God knows who's on this society. The uh, society is convinced that the president should ensure that federal buildings feature beautiful architecture with a preference for classical architecture over what they call the elite preference for classical architecture 
over elite modernist design fads. Now, Trump and his society assert that we, modern architects and ex-modern architects who control government architecture, have been forcing ugly designs on their fellow Americans. They were deriding the very idea of what beauty consists of and creating countless buildings that were so bad that no one wanted to look at them or even work in them. Now, acceptable styles had to be derived, quote, from the forms, principle, and vocabulary of the architecture of Greek and Roman antiquity. But however, the executive order names several preferred and default styles that are also deemed to be sufficiently and classical. So that included neoclassical, Georgian, federal, Greek revival, Beaux-Arts, and Art Deco. Trump has also stated that he approves of Gothic, Romanesque, Spanish colonial, and other Mediterranean styles, such as his Mar-a-Lago home in Florida, found in Florida and the American Southwest. The process would be that architects would have to present their designs to a presidential beautification commission for their determination as to whether the building was appropriately and sufficiently classical in style. But it's the White House that would make the final determination. Thus, Trump would be given broad power, which is all he ever wants, to make aesthetic appraisal, something he knows nothing about. Now, state-mandated design concepts, such as those set forth in Trump's executive order, soon to be overthrown by Joe Biden, hark back to the authoritarian dictates on the style of architecture by fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Hitler's favorite architect, Albert Speer, was inspired to create buildings and city plans of such an enormous and basically inhuman scale as to install awe and fear in its subjects. That's what one would... Uh, would first experience because there was very little later to nothing of real beauty in these sort of outsized, titanic, megalomaniacal designs. And here we have a megalomaniacal, I can't even say it now, of Trump's executive order on what proper architecture should be for civic federal building. <laughs> Well, that being said, uh, let's use a couple of minutes left to go to that country of Germany that you were referring to, and let's take a look how that could look like. And I'll let you guys judge that. What are we looking at? Uh, what are we looking at? I we're looking at, we're looking at a classicist floor plan that's pretty much axial symmetric. Right. And I think it's a federal building that's for the federal are we looking, government. Are, are we looking at cafeteria? Are we looking at your uh, design for the army building, which is the joint uh, dining hall and um, auditorium? I believe so. And okay, good. Go the next slide. There we are. There is the building that I recognize. Mm -hmm. This is a building that you designed for the German government, meaning specifically the military. And pardon me, a dog is barking in the background as I'm trying to speak. Um, there was a mandate in this particular case that red brick had to be used, which is harkens to the California college campus that Ed Killingsworth was the overseer of and for which Ron worked, or on which Ron worked. But the building that we're talking about here, the German military building, although it does have a classical, uh, has classical lines to it and uh, dimensions and uh, proportions on one side, on the other side, faces outwards with this glass wall with the um, wooden louvers on it. And in this particular case, the glass wall in this temperate cold climate will be used to gather, is used to gather solar energy at the time of the year when it's needed. It also, as you pointed out, was to be giving the inhabitants inside, the men in the army, the chance to look out on a public road and see the civilian world outside from which they were cut off. But it also, as uh, Ron said before the show started, puts the inhabitants or the people inside on display for anybody on the outside, looking at them inhabiting it and using it indoors. And I think we can go to the next picture and look at what the inside looks like, which is a very elegant looking building. It's very upscale looking for a military facility and that's something that I hope the people who've used it really appreciate 
that it isn't institutional looking, but it looks like a beautiful building. And um, bravo to Martin Despang and Despang Architects for doing this. I must say that I was so impressed with the theatricality of the building because the military people who are either meeting or having a meal or both inside are on display as if they were actors mm -hmm. on some sort of a play. And that South Elevation is an enormous theatrical proscenium with a sloping wood theater roof. Handsome, theatrical, modern, classical space. Thank you. And thank you both for the nice words. And go to the next slide. Ron, also thanking you uh, in, in two capacities, obviously as the finest classicist architect in the tradition of your friend and boss, Ed, but also as, an, as someone who can relate very well to the users because you're a proud veteran. So thank you very much, means a lot to me. And go to the last slide here, uh, me uh, sharing uh, three things about the building. On the right side, we're making quotations to a previous show about it that we say we as architects have the power and should use that power to inform political opinion. Here was Ursula von der Leyen, who was at that time the Secretary of Defense, is now the leader of the European Union that we had a chance to talk to each other and educate each other about the Bauhaus and um, classicism and other things. Also to get the into books, this is Paul's bookstore at the bottom where we saw it published in a book called Tellingly, The Architecture of Democracy. And last but not at least, when things are opening up more, we wanna take you out there at the very top on study abroad trips. But the big thing we see at the left is a paper that when the University of Nebraska Lincoln had sent me out to present it on an ACSA conference, I was in competition with a guy next door who was uh, talking about something you had been pointing out, the architecture of Auschwitz, which put me in an interesting position. And then there was the keynote speaker that was Richard Rogers, who basically said, I built for everyone except the military. But I think our point here in, in this show is like, okay, don't shy away from anything, approach things and face things in, in society not in a cynical way, but in a cultivated way. And, um, you know, and let's go down to federal buildings and basically do the best to design them as, as, as post-fossil buildings that are not formal anymore, that are performative and, and truly speak uh, about the, the times we're in, we're facing of, again, climate change uh, and, and social inequity and a pandemic that we have. And architecture, as we point out, uh, not only can, but basically has to address all that. So with that, we're at the end of the show, but there's gonna be more from us reflecting on that. And that's gonna happen next week. So see y'all back for that. Until, and until then stay obviously most importantly healthy and happy. Thank you guys, bye-bye. Oh,